Hi there. I hope you guys are tuning in okay. Welcome to the 2014 Rotness Channel Swim program as written by us, Swim Smooth, uh, based in Perth in Western Australia. If you guys are tuning in to find out a little bit more about swimming across to the Rotness Island, which is 19.7 kilometres on Saturday the 22nd of February, then you're in the right place. I'm also going to try and run this uh, Google Hangout as a bit of an option to, uh, to discuss some of my views um, and learned experience, I guess, on swimming marathons and having just won the, uh, the Man Manhattan Island Marathon swim back in June, um, hopefully some of my uh, ideas and tips on training, etc., could be uh, really beneficial for you. Now, I'm just getting a little bit of feedback here, so just give me one second. Swim Smooth, based in Perth in Western Australia. If you guys are tuning in to find out a little bit more about swimming across the Rotness Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to start the presentation. Get rid of my ugly mug. Here we go then. So a nice little um, picture there of uh, the guys in the uh, that's in the team event swimming off to uh, to Rotness Island. You can see that was a beautiful. Uh, sunny morning on the uh, in 2009 at the start of the event in 2009. One of my favourite shots of the uh, the event, just sort of showing the scale of it, and uh, with all the boats out there waiting for the swimmers to uh, to attend. So if this is your first attempt at the Rotness Channel swim, then uh, hopefully these tips are going to give you some uh, good uh, motivation for for moving forwards over the next 20 weeks. Okay, this is a nice little uh, picture of myself and uh, my wife Michelle just coming in. We did a uh, Rotness duo event in 2010, uh, just a year after we had our first baby Jackson, and um, that was a pretty good event to do as a duo. So whether or not you're joining us to learn a little bit more about um, swimming across to Rotness as a team, as a duo, or indeed as a solo swimmer, then hopefully we can provide you with some useful information here. So I'd like to go through a bit of a program overview. If you've uh, visited our website, or rather the uh, the Swim Smooth Perth blogspot, which can be found at swimsmoothperth.blogspot.com, you'll have seen recently that we just put up a 21-week training program leading up to the Rotness Channel Swim on the 22nd of February. That's a very comprehensive program, and the aim of this presentation is to go through a little bit of that program. You'll be able to download it. It's a PDF program. It's about 12 pages long, and just giving you a little bit of um, further insight into what we're going to be talking about this evening. Also just going to have a chat about the blog itself um, and our email group and also some of the calendar updates that I've actually gone, and gone through and created for this program. I'm going to look at some of the training venues that we're using. I just checked out the Claremont Jetty this morning for the first time in the last couple of months, expecting it only to be about 15 or 16 degrees in, in the water there, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that it was about uh, 19 or 20 degrees in there, albeit a little bit murky from all the recent rain that we just had. We're going to go through some of the types of sessions that I'd be recommending you do on a weekly basis, including the key sessions that are going to get you across to Rotnest in good shape. We're also going to have a look at pace awareness and setting your Rotnest solo, if you are doing the solo, or even if you're working as a team or duo swimmer, your pace awareness for getting across the island is absolutely essential. Far too many people in the past have set off way, way too fast, and uh, certainly I know pace awareness is something that's held me back a little bit in the past and something which I've worked on diligently over the last five years whilst I've been working on um, improving my marathon swimming. We're going to have a chat about shoulder injury management. Usually each year I get invited by the Rottnest Channel Swim Association themselves to uh, do a little bit of a talk about shoulder injury and how to actually manage that. So I'm going to give you some uh, tips on what you should be doing with your technique both uh, in your technique training leading up to the event and also how to manage shoulder issues on the day itself. We're going to have a look at nutrition strategies, things that have worked for me in the past and also some advice on uh, some general nutrition strategies which you might like to look at incorporating between now and the event. Practice here is essential. Now this is a little bit of a uh, grey area. Many people believe that there is some sort of magic potion to getting across to the uh, across to the, the island um, in as straight a line as possible. Obviously with GPS tracking devices etc. In theory it should be possible to track a very straight line across there. But things such as um, tidal pushes and currents and wind and weather etc. can throw things a little bit off course and um, we'll have a little bit of a chat about uh, some of the things I've seen in the past. 
Um, I think the major thing that will come out from that though is that there is no mate, there is no magic strategy, and um, certainly if you have a um, a well experienced skipper, that's going to uh, going to be very very beneficial. And and just having made out a good uh, training plan as well with your uh, with the team as well there. We're going to look at some uh, additional resources as well to round off the presentation. Now here are um, three of our Rotnest solo swim group from uh, this was from 2010. Uh, that's Kimmy there on the uh, on the left, Lottie in the middle, and uh, Lorraine here on the uh, on the right hand side of the picture as you look at it. These three ladies uh, were doing their the first their first ever Rotnest solo swim. And what's really nice about this is um, all three ladies got across the island in uh, in well under eight hours. Uh, Kimmy and Lorraine in particular just over the seven hour marker. Um, which was absolutely a fantastic um, achievement on the on the day. Both those ladies would admit to you that at the start of the program they were probably swimming around about the 150 mark per 100 meters um, for you know for example for a thousand meters um, straight. So they would say that they weren't the fastest swimmers going into the program, but in the end did some fantastic times. And most of us would be very very pleased with uh, a seven hour swim across to Rotnest. So well done, girls. It's a, a great photo just seeing you moments before the. Start. And as we can see, they're nice and dark, and uh, maybe a little bit intimidating looking at the dark, murky waters of Cottesloe Beach. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, the program overview. So, if you uh, download the actual training program, the 12-week PDF, on one of those pages is what we can see here, off on the left-hand side. Now. Probably the first point that I want to make about this is it's a 21-week program, so you don't need to go at this at like a bull in a china shop. Um, many people set off for a Rotness program, or maybe for an Ironman event, or let's say, for example, you swim in the English Channel and get a little bit panicked about exactly what sort of um, how much sort of volume they're fitting in very very early on within the program. It's very very important that you just ease your way into this. 21 weeks is a long long time. It's 144 days. Apparently, according to the Rotnest Channel Swim website, until the actual event. So, by breaking things down, as you can see here on the left hand side, hopefully we can apply a bit of a cautious approach to building up and uh, preparing you for that. One of the things that I hear time and time again in the squad sessions that I run is people really building up the sessions to uh, a bit of an ordeal. So, for example, if you had a bad session, a lot of people place so much emphasis on that bad session and think, oh my god, my training's all over, it's all going downhill, how am I ever going to get across to Rotnest, etc., etc. What I really strongly encourage you to do is think of every single session, just one part of the whole picture not the key part of the whole picture, just one part. And really, if you are going to be getting in around about 100 sessions between now and the event, you're literally talking about 1% per uh, per session there. Um, so nothing to get to too overly wound up about. We all have bad sessions. We've got to get through that. And we've got to keep our focus on the, uh, on the bigger picture. So the race schedule. Um, Again, if you go to, um, if you download the program, you'll actually see where I've actually linked in the WA 2013-2014 Open Water Series race calendar. I've actually incorporated some of the events into the program, but not all of them. Some of you will like to race very frequently. In fact, you might like to almost do most of the 5 and 10K open water events as your way of just developing and building your endurance and also your confidence over those longer distances. Some of you might be a little bit more budget constrained and would prefer to do a little bit more training by themselves. The program is sort of uh, an in-between. So I've selected maybe uh, a half dozen, seven or so uh, key races to, uh, to look at entering, including the, uh, the qualifying events for the event, if you're doing the solo swim, um, that being the, uh, the final one being the Sorrento 10K event at the end of, uh, end of January. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the race schedule itself is, uh, can be viewed um, from within the program. There's a little link in there, and it's worthwhile having a little look at uh, which events you're going to be wanting to do. I've listed them here in orange as the lower priority events, and the uh, and the reds as the as the higher priority ones. So you can see we don't really kick kick start the the racing program per se, at least not properly, until the start of uh, December. Now, a big question I have, uh, especially from new solo swimmers, is, uh, or rather, I, I hear of an anticipation of. Or concern for not being able to qualify for the event, or what if I leave it till the last minute and something goes wrong, or my goggles snap, or I have a bad swim and I don't get through the 10k event. 
a lot of people, if we look at the program there, the first 10K event open to you is in mid-November at City Beach. I, partic I personally did that event last year and wasn't in the best shape uh, leading into the event. There were also, for those of you who actually swam it, there were huge amounts of jellyfish and many people got stung to death in there. Now, I'd encourage you, strongly, strongly encourage you to potentially look at the possibility of leaving your qualifying event until after Christmas. Um, there is the Sorrento 10K, of course. There's also the Perth BHP Billiton 10K event uh, right at the start of February as well. You might think that's leaving it a little bit too late uh, for qualifying for the Rottnest Solo Swim. However, by doing getting into these 10k events a little bit too soon you've possibly run the risk of injury maybe just overdoing it or even scaring yourself off a little bit as well so for example if you for example if you entered the city beach 10k events and you've never done anything more than let's say three or four k's but you want to do the solo swim this time around you get to the event you think oh, i'm seven weeks into the program here i should be all right for a 10k and bam you get to six or seven kilometers and you think oh my god what's happened to my shoulders I'm never going to get through this event is that going to scare you off the whole program would you be better off waiting for another five six seven weeks of development to try and get your base base fitness up your endurance up there and just get your shoulders stronger to get you through the event and with a little bit more confidence my personal suggestion would be to leave it a little bit later on. Now, there was a, an, an issue a few years ago when by uh, the qualifying event at Sorrento actually got cancelled. I believe it was either a shark or really bad weather, but it did get cancelled. And what we had to do uh, as coaches was go around and actually sign affidavits for the, uh, for the swimmers who hadn't qualified just to sort of show that they could get across that you know, um, around the uh, the 10k course so what I personally did was ran a 12k uh, pool session up at Challenge Stadium um, where every one of my swimmers who were racing that year came along did the 12k and I simply signed um, signed them off on that that 12k program is listed here within the uh, swim smooth program this year 2013-2014 and uh, we do feature it um, towards the uh, towards the start of January it's a really good event to or a really good uh, session to actually try and incorporate Above all, be consistent with your training program. So you might look at things and think, wow, I can actually hit seven sessions a week here. I can set eight sessions, can do a double session on one day. And you all go into it very well sort of buoyed up thinking this is going to be possible. But then the reality of your work life, your home life, um, social life starts to catch up on you and you start to become quite inconsistent. First and foremost, is that's going to disappoint you. It's going to frustrate you if you've set yourself goals which are maybe just a little bit out of your reach. The best thing you can possibly do is spend this next two or three weeks just trying to work out exactly how many sessions you can possibly fit in. View it as a bit of a build-up with the biggest build-up occurring after the Christmas period. And, uh, and like I say, make sure you are consistent in your training above all else. When I... Um, when I trained up for the Manhattan Island Marathon Swim, I was I worked out that my average training volume was around about 40 kilometers per week. Now that might sound a lot uh, for somebody who's just building up for the Rottnest Solo Swim for the first time, but considering that many of the swimmers were in the 60 to 70 kilometer marker, and indeed the guy who finished second to me was swimming in excess of 120 kilometers a week, you'll appreciate that big training volume doesn't necessarily win the day. It's about being smart with your training, and above all, being consistent. You'll hear me saying that word a lot. <laughs> Here's a nice little shot of uh, me starting the 2011 Rottnest Solo Swim with my buddy paddling there for me on the left-hand side. I really like this shot. It gives an indication of the, uh, the chop that morning as we set off and also the rising sun. One of my fondest memories of my very first solo swim in 2009 was looking over my right shoulder, seeing the sun coming up and, uh, and just thinking, wow, this is it really having to pinch myself, feeling fantastic. I'd done all the preparation and this was me swimming across to the Rottnest Island. And um, I really recommend you savor that moment when you uh, experience it in 144 days time. So just looking a little bit at the blog, um, as I mentioned before, we've got a, a swimsmoothperth.blogspot.com. This is where I send out regular updates to the uh, to the squad's training program. Um, for those of you who are interested in joining the squad, I will let you know at this moment in time, pretty much every squad session is fully booked. If you wanted to get in, please just drop me over an email, swimsmooth at me.com, and I will let you know when um, availability in the squad becomes uh, becomes available. 
Um, if you're interested to register for that blog, just to have it uh, posted out to you automatically, just go to swimsmooth.com forward slash perf and there's a little sign up box on the right hand side. I strongly encourage you all to, uh, to do that. Now there's some calendar updates as well. If you're, if you're using things like your iPhone or your iPad, you have a calendar iCal set up on there. Um, I've actually gone in there and incorporated a, uh, a calendar with updates, etc., giving you, giving you full notifi notification of when the races are coming up, etc., and that's all done automatically for you. So just follow the little links from within the PDF program, and that will set that up for you. Very easily done. Like I say, just add, ask, uh, email me um, to be added to the Rotnest uh, group list, which currently is around about 200 people. So we've got quite a lot of people interested in, in what we're doing with the Rotnest training program. You can also follow me on Twitter, at SwimSmoothPaul, uh, where I post out some of my own training um, sessions, which you might sort of be, uh, be quite interested to, to use as part of your, uh, your resources for your own training. And um, yeah, there we go. Now, this was the uh, the squad in 2011, or at least part of it. We had quite, uh, I believe we had 67 um, people from the squad actually complete the uh, the solo swim that year, and this is a, a bunch of them after the event. As you can see, we're all looking pretty pumped up that we've just finished and got across the line there. Okay, training venues. Well, over here to the left-hand side, we've got a GPS trace of uh, Coldazo Beach across to uh, Thompson's Bay on Rottnest Island, 19.7 kilometres. Doesn't look so far when you look at it from that angle, of course, sort of thing. But um, it is a long way, and it's going to take you guys somewhere between about five and possibly up to even ten. So the venues that we're using for the squad, and also the swim sessions that I do, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about those. On a um, Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll be swimming at the Claremont Pool at about 11 to 11:30 11 starting time. Once I've finished with my one-to-one -one sessions, so if ever you have a uh, spare lunch break and fancy coming down and joining me, I would be very glad of the company. Um, Thursday mornings, we're now down at um, the Claremont Jetty meeting at 5.45, usually in the water by about 6 a.m. I'm also down at Claremont Pool myself as well, swimming on a Friday afternoon, usually between about 1 and 1.30. So uh, Claremont Pool is the place to be for your Rotnest Channel Swim program. Um, as mentioned there, we also use the Claremont Jetty itself, which I'll show you a video, uh, show you a photograph of in just a moment's time. It's a, um, it's a great venue if you've never been down there, just off Victoria Road in Claremont. So if you uh, just sort of follow the uh, the road around past the uh, the hospital there on the uh, on the right hand side, Jetty Road is just off Victoria Avenue, and there's a probably very limited car parking spacing actually down there, about five or six spaces. So you may end up having to park on Victoria Avenue itself and just walking down. But it's a great venue. The thing I like about Claremont Jetty is the fact that it's uh, usually fairly calm and flat, and you could say, well, that's not really replicating the swimming course to Rottnest when it's quite rough and choppy. But uh, it gives you very sort of predictable conditions usually. Um, it's fairly shallow, between about 1.5 and 2.5 meters, and usually pretty, cle uh, pretty clean and clear. Having said that, this morning it was like a soup down there, very, very um, dirty, <laughs> murky waters, etc. Um, the good thing was we didn't see any jellyfish or get stung by any jellyfish, but um, it is a good um, uh, control environment for which to swim with, you know, a good group of let's say 20 or 30 people. Um, we have a little 1k loop marked out, so 1k out, 1k back, so 2k loop in total, and uh, we can swim anything up to, well, I think the longest swim down there, down there, is, down there is about 24 or 25 kilometres, but that's probably a bit overboard for a Rottnest solo swim, that was for training for the English Channel. So Claymont Jetty is, uh, is where it's at. Um, the way I sort of view this is that um, obviously you do need some rough water, open ocean practice. Um, given the um, prevalence of shark alarms etc at the moment. I do know a lot of people are quite wary about swimming in the ocean. Of course there are bull sharks in the river. I've never actually seen one or come across one. I've seen a few dolphins in there but never a bull shark touch wood. Um, so in the ocean obviously with the events in over 10 k's in the um, in the ocean there I would, I would encourage you to practice um, practice your rough water swimming in and amongst four or five hundred other swimmers um, just to uh, reduce your risk, risk there a little bit. Um, also, I do a bit of uh, swimming up at Challenge Stadium um, early on a f uh, Saturday morning at 5.30 in the outdoor 10-lane pool. By all means, please meet me out there if, uh, if you wish. Um, the sessions 
to start off the program are all detailed on our uh, within the training program, the PDF program, starting off this weekend with a 3K time trial from which we'll actually start to work out what your Roto pace is. More on that in a moment. And obviously race venues like I just mentioned in there. So there's our beautiful Claremont pool. This is actually just before the refurbishment, but you can see the mist coming off the uh, off the water. Hopefully, we're over those cold mornings now. And we can get cracking with some nice, uh, nice sunny days down at Claremont Pool. There you go, Challenge Stadium. Beautiful shot there. At, this is the outdoor eight-lane pool. Around the corner is the outdoor ten where we swim on Saturday mornings. Just as an informal group, we don't have we don't actually have a booking down there, um, and at the moment, like I say, the last few weeks it's literally only been myself down there. But uh, but if you want to join me, by all means, please do so. Claremont Jetty, a shot from this morning, as you can see, beautiful uh, view there. We've got these uh, boats in the middle of the shot, of course. Um, where we're actually walking out to is walking out to uh, to obviously swimmable depth. Um, the jetty is just out of the shot to the right hand side. And um, once we're out to that swimmable, swimmable depth, we basically swim all the way along the line of the boats, keeping those on our right hand side until the boat that you can see in the very far left hand corner with a blue awning on the back. That's 500 meters. Turn a right around there, follow the shoreline along to between the two limestone walls. There's a very tall palm tree there with an old tin boat tied up against it. That's the, uh, the next 500 meter marker, so the 1000 meter point. At that point, turn around, retrace your steps back, and you've done two Ks. Very, very simple, and like I say, barely secure down there. Obviously, this is one of the open water venues that's used quite a bit. Champion Lakes, many people would think being such a long rectangular swim course that it'd be very easy to navigate. However, you can see these boys out there, with it being a, a, a regatta rowing lake, um, they actually do make it quite com uh, confusing for, for holding a straight line at Champion Lakes. So if you ever swim down there, be aware of that. Um, they can throw you off your course a little bit. Okay, type of sessions. Let's get into some good stuff now then. So like I say, if you're tuning into this or watching this and you're not swimming Loch Ness, but you're thinking about doing a marathon swim somewhere else around the world, uh, or maybe you're interested in doing the, uh, the, Mar the uh, English Channel swim, or maybe Manhattan or Catalina Channel, etc., then hopefully some of the advice that I'm going to go through just now will help you with that. So. Obviously, one of the things that I'm very, very um, prudent about with Swim Smooth, generally speaking, is to try and keep things simple. A realistic, consistent routine trumps everything else time and time again. Um, at Bath University, which is where I studied and was also on the world-class triathlon uh, training program, um, the program which we used to follow was seemingly very boring. It seemed to be the same thing week in, week out. And looking back at it, immediately after graduating as a sports scientist, uh, or graduating as sports science at least, um, I often thought to myself, surely it should be more varied than that. Surely there should be more seemingly science to it. Why do we just keep doing the same thing week in, week out? Well, of course, it wasn't exactly the same thing week in, week out. It was a very consistent program which we got our bodies got used to and adapted to. So we knew, for example, on a Monday morning we'd be doing a hard 10-400 set. On Tuesday we'd be doing some threshold work. Wednesday, a little bit of sprint and technique work, et cetera, et cetera. And that routine, establishing that routine was very, very important because it just gave us a consistent base. I think a lot of people try to make their training programs a little bit too confusing, too complicated. And, um, you know, whilst it might look good on paper, it doesn't necessarily pan out that well in reality. I've certainly been party to, uh, to doing that. When I first arrived over here in Perth, in Western Australia in 2012, I tried to make our... Um, triathlon training program a little bit too complicated at the time every session was completely different I was very aware that people wanted a lot of variety but sometimes losing um, you know losing sight of the, the wood for all the uh, all the trees out there so uh, try and keep it consistent try and keep it uh, simple and uh, let's have a little bit of a breakdown on how we, how we might do that so if I just talk through what I would personally do um, during a week um, let's start off at the weekend because uh, that's normally when you get a chance to do your longer swims or maybe you're racing one of the 10k events. If you view that as your long continuous swims, you might even do that on the Saturday or on the Sunday. Following one of those um, sessions, on the Monday, I would normally incorporate a little bit of technique work. So it might be just simply 3,000 meters going through some drills and technique work which is going to help to loosen off your chest and shoulders. 
some of my favorite exercises to do at that point are things like the broken arrow drill or simply kicking on the side 616 just to think about drawing your shoulder blades together and back getting that technique really honed in on the Monday morning helping to recover from the weekend's um, exercises then on a Tuesday as we do down with the squad I'd normally do something with again a little bit more technique work and also building in a little bit of endurance on a Wednesday, most of you who come along to the session, it is our most popular session of the week, it's arguably the hardest session we do, is the uh, Wednesday morning 5.30 endurance session. Here's an example of that over to the left hand side. We call this the red mist set. So called because halfway through the set, you're actually swimming at a sub threshold pace, so it's, the speed isn't massively high but it's just a relentless, monotonous pace. I think of it very much as a slog, um, but it is the same sort of pace that you get into swimming across to the Rocknest Island. And um, the reason we call it Red Mist is because people often get quite snappy and irritable during these sessions. You know, if somebody cuts you up or you feel like you're falling off your times or what have you, it's very easy to get snappy and irritable. So this session itself on a Wednesday morning is absolutely fantastic at trying to control your temper and control yourself um, and your emotions and your mood etc when you're starting to feel the crunch and of course when you're swimming five to ten hours across to Rottnest Island you're going to go through at least one of those periods in that time so uh, this session on Wednesday morning if you never get down to it I often post this out on Twitter the session that we've done so if you're not able to join us uh, because the squad is actually full now then uh, watch out for those um, events popping up on Twitter uh, or those sessions popping up on Twitter and uh, following along with them the basic red mist set is a series of 10 times 400 meters starting off with four 400s um, at what would be a CSS pace uh, plus six seconds per hundred I'll go through CSS in just a second then we go three 400s at CSS plus five two 400s at CSS plus four and then finally a 400 meters at CSS plus three now CSS is basically your threshold pace It's the pace that you would be able to maintain for around about 1500 meters and as a continuous hard swim you can work this out by obviously doing a 1500 meter time trial or you can jump onto our website swimsmooth.com forward slash training and following the advice there to complete a CSS test set using a 400 meter and a 200 meter um, time trial during the same session what this does is the 400 very simply looks at how aerobically fit you are and the 200 looks at how anaerobically fit you are that's a bit of an overly simplistic way of looking at it but what we look at is the, the rate of drop-off between those two speeds and the gradient that's created between that gives you a pace per 100 meters that you should be able to hold for 1500 from there we can then look at assessing or setting sessions for example CSS plus six is moderately uh, a sort of moderate sort of pace whereas CSS plus two or three is starting to get really quite hard so you can see on that Wednesday morning session when we start to take you down to CSS plus two or three it is getting quite hard towards the end of a four or five K swim set um, on a Friday morning we actually do a little bit of work purely at CSS pace so it's shorter intervals 100 200 meters etc and then obviously back to the weekend with the uh, with the longer swim at the weekend there so try and keep it simple there's obviously more information about that in the training program try not to get overly complicated with what you're doing and just try and follow through from there like I was mentioning red mist certainly helps to build up your mental toughness and that's absolutely essential for a swim like this there's the red mist appearing in somebody's goggles no doubt during the uh, the Wednesday morning session try to control it we do see it quite often I uh, sometimes carry around a pair of rose tinted goggles to hand to somebody with the uh, biggest amount of red mist building up inside their own goggles i.e. the person who's getting a little bit aggravated and, uh, and stressy as they're going on you need to uh, I love this expression Aussie expression you need to toughen up princess so there we go Another nice shot here. This is <laughs> this is me after having finished the uh, 2011 Rottnest swim. You can see that I've put absolutely everything into that. The medical staff looking a little bit concerned, uh, but certainly the uh, the mental uh, aptitude that you build up during those uh, red mist sessions really carries through for the uh, for the Rottnest swim. Okay, on to pace awareness, my uh, favourite topic, and equally the one which I'm most hypocritical about, albeit I'm uh, getting a lot lot better at that now. So finding your rottenness pace and then getting really economical at it is absolutely key to success. 
the uh, the graph here on the left hand side is from my GPS device across the uh, Rotnest across to uh, Rotnest in 2011. Um, now we believe there was a little bit of a uh, current after around about uh, 55 um, minutes into the swim. You can see a little bit of a drop down and then a fairly consistent plateau towards about the last hour of that swim, whereby we got caught in the current um, and, uh, and slowed down even further. But um, both w across the Rotness and obviously during your training program, it's very, very important that you learn what your Rotto pace is and, uh, and you get very good at just simple pace awareness. So defining what your Rotness pace is early on within the program. This Saturday, we've got a 3,000 meter time trial up at Challenge Stadium at 5.30 a.m. Come along for that if you can make it. Time yourself, find out what pace you can hold. And then over the course of the next 21 weeks, for a lot of you, especially if you're fairly underdeveloped um, or unfit at this moment in time, your 3,000 meter pace will be quite close to what you'll end up sustaining for your relative swim speed across to Rotnest Island. Now, people often ask me, going into the event, you know, how long should it take me, etc. I normally bank on um, your rotness speed being around about six to eight, maybe even up to 10 seconds per 100 meters slower than what your current CSS pace is going into the swim. So for example, I've gone into the swim on quite a few occasions, being at around about the one, um, around about the 115, 116 per 100 meter pace, I end up swimming across there in around about 125 to 126. Don't forget to add on a, uh, a couple of extra sessions, uh, seconds per 100 meters as well for your feed stops, and, um, and you're up to around about 130 or uh, just over there per 100 meters. So it's good to know where this benchmark is, this CSS pace, because obviously we can refer to everything relative to that point. It's not hard to work out, and it's good to sort of monitor how that improves over the course of the program. Don't too, do too much sprint work. Um, a lot of people think in order to get a lot faster, they need to be doing a lot of sprint work with lots of rest and recovery. CSS training is not like that at all. In fact, if you've never done any CSS work, like I say, check out swimsmooth.com forward slash training, work out what your pace is, look at some of the suggested sessions on there, maybe even get yourself a copy of our uh, Swim Smooth book, a small plug there, and uh, it contains quite a few uh, CSS training se sessions in the back. If you've never done any work at that intensity before, it's very likely, especially within the first three or 400 meters of the, uh, of the main set, to think, oh, this is just too easy. I should be working a lot harder than that. But the way CSS works is working on developing your endurance economy um, with very short rest and recovery periods. So obviously when you're swimming across to Rottnest Island, there is no stopping. If you stop, the, tim the timer is obviously still running. You've got to keep yourself moving. Make those sprint stops as quick as possible, but ultimately, the swimmer who gets there across, across to Rottnest Island the first is the swimmer who's held the quickest average pace. And um, certainly a lot of sprint work is not going to help you with that if you're taking lots of rest and recovery periods. Um, what you will notice, especially if you've, um, you may already have some experience with this with endurance events like Ironman, you will expect or should expect a bit of a drop off in your pure speed as you start to develop your endurance economy for the Rottnest Channel Swim. That's to be perfectly expected. Uh, people get about you know four or five weeks out, realize their 100 meter time isn't what it used to be and think, oh my god, it's all gone downhill. I'm not interested in what you can do 100 meters in four or five weeks out from the Rottnest Channel Swim. I am interested in what you might do for 1,000 or 1,500 or let's say 10 kilometers. 50 meters, 100 meters, not interested, sorry. Sound a little bit harsh there. Um, <laughs> and finally, onto this, economy is absolutely everything. Becoming a diesel engine is what it's all about. In, in 2011, I put together this little uh, Rotnest um, swimmer's shirt for all of our uh, squad. You can see here the Rotto diesel swimming engine. I tried to make this uh, look a little bit like a Haynes manual, the coach's workshop manual on the back there. The whole idea being that you know we don't want a fuel a petrol or fuel injected petrol engine to get across to Rottnest. We need to develop the economy, that diesel engine, you know, uh, getting across there and just holding a good sustainable pace for the longest period of time. Okay, this is uh, something which many of you will be interested in, regardless of which sort of event you're doing. This is a fantastic photograph here of Ingrid Bruin. Looks like she's had her head twisted around backwards, but in actual fact, that's just the, showing the flexibility in her shoulders there. Absolutely incredible. It's Ingrid Bruin from, uh, from the Netherlands. Now, um, 
the thing with shoulder injury um, or, or management of your shoulder pain, etc., the first thing you need to come to accept really is that you will feel some shoulder discomfort at some point during this program. That's absolutely guaranteed. Now, whether that shoulder discomfort is simply a bit of mild um, fatigue from uh, from some of your longer sessions, or it starts to develop into a little bit of a niggle, something you might need to go and see a physio about, etc., you are going to feel some pain in the shoulders. We're obviously going to take you through now how to try and avoid some of that, but um, it's very, very important that um, you sort of understand going into these sort of longer distance events, everyone at some point feels some discomfort in their shoulders. In fact, I think uh, the stats are around about 80% of adult swimmers at some point in their swimming career will feel some sort of level of shoulder discomfort. And uh, and that's going to be for adults who, you know, classify themselves as more of recreational swimmers, maybe swimming once or twice per week for a couple of kilometers, not somebody swimming 25, 30 kilometers a week, building up for their first rock nest solo swim. So the key is management. Now, what I often find when I'm getting into a little bit of a program is after about two or three weeks, um, I start to get a couple of niggles in my shoulders. In fact, right now I can feel a little bit in both my left and right shoulder in exactly the same spot. I don't panic about that. I consider this is a little bit of a settling in period. I can't explain it from a medical background, although uh, there was a study done um, earlier on this year for the Rotness Solo Swimmers, which will be published later on this year, talking about this settling in period. Basically, around about two or three weeks into the program, once your body starts to adapt and you start to add on a little bit of load to your training, you do start to feel a little bit of discomfort within the shoulders, I find. And uh, the best thing to do at this point is just to back off your intensity and your, uh, your, your volume just a little bit, just for a couple of days, manage your shoulders, get some massage, do a bit of stretching, get the TheraBands out, and just make sure you look after yourself. Don't keep plowing through at this point. If you back off just a little bit, you should start to come through that period. Like I say, I can't explain that medically, um, but uh, it's just something which I notice every single time I try to start one of these uh, one of these programs. So just watch out for that. You will get through it if you manage it properly. Okay, so here's some of the classic um, things which might cause shoulder pain. In fact, what I might just do here is um, no, I think I can. Uh, yeah, I will actually just come out of the. Um, out of the screen and bring myself back up. So hopefully you can see me here now. Now, if we're talking about how to avoid shoulder pain, a couple of the key things which often cause pain in swimmers' shoulders are a thumb first entry into the water. Now, if you've been swimming a long time like I have and maybe even come from the UK, you may have been taught to enter into the water thumb first as a smoother way for the hand to enter into the water. Now, I'm not sure good how, how good my speakers are, but even just doing that, you maybe just heard a bit of a click on my shoulder. So we need to be watching out for a thumb first. This excessive internal rotation of the shoulder joint is bad news for your shoulders and should never be done. We should be entering into the water in more of a neutral position with the fingertips entering first into the water. If you check out swimsmooth.com forward slash injury, you'll see some more advice and information about that. Now, combined with a thumb first entry, many swimmers tend to cross over in front of their head as they're entering into the water. This is also another bad thing for you to be doing. Very, very common for us to, uh, to actually see this. This can also cause the body to snake down the pool or jackknife through the middle, swim off course, etc. But when you're crossing over and thumb first, even if you just try this little exercise now, just copy what I'm doing, you can really feel just how much stress and strain that puts on the front of the shoulder. Not good news for your shoulders. So watch out for those two things. Video analysis, of course, will show that up. Unfortunately, I'm personally fully booked until um, until the start of April now for my video analysis sessions. They are very popular. Um, but if you check out, uh, if you shoot me over an email, swimsmooth at me.com, we'll get you booked in with uh, Sally Scafidi, one of our certified swimsmooth coaches, who will take a look at your shoulders for you and uh, check, make sure your uh, your stroke is in good order. Poor posture is pretty good. I just caught myself there, hunched over, not very good. If you are on a desk job all day, hunching the shoulders over, rounding the shoulders is bad news. We need to be thinking about drawing the shoulder blades together and back. Okay, When we swim a lot, we tend to get quite tight through the pectorals. That tends to hunch the shoulders over. What you want to be doing is you don't want to be getting into the gym and doing work on the front of the shoulder. So things like bench presses and 
pec decks and stuff like that, bad news. We need to be strengthening up what's happening behind the shoulders. So things like seated upright rowing, lat pull downs, etc. Even just working with some therabands, some external rotation with the therabands is all good news. You want to be stretching through the front of the shoulders here. And as I'll show you in a couple of the um, slides in a second, I'll show you some of the stretches that will help you with that. Lack of flexibility, obviously we see in Gilly Bruin in the um, in the video clip in the picture a moment ago with that amazing level of flexibility. Um, I don't imagine any of you have flexibility in that sort of level. But what you want to be careful about, as I've found over the years, is that swimmers, and this is reported in recent medical research as well, swimmers who tend to struggle with shoulder injury are the ones who sporadically stretch and in, incorporate a flexibility program within their um, within their training. So swim, what studies have shown is that swimmers who do a lot of stretching or swimmers who do no stretching are least likely to end up with uh, with injuries, shoulder injuries. And apparently this also refers to, uh, to other sports as well, so lower limb injuries in running, etc. So um, it's quite a, quite important that um, if you do if you are going to be doing some flexibility, you get again you get into a good regular consistent routine. Don't go at it hammering tongs. In fact, before your swim sessions, be very careful about doing some hardcore stretching. You often see swimmers arriving on the pool doing a big stretch across the top, but the muscles might be quite cold, or it might be early in the morning, etc., etc. You need to make sure you've actually warmed up your muscles first before you do any major stretching. And usually, some of the best flexibility gains can be made in the shower after your training session, a nice warm shower. Obviously one of the other things that might potentially cause, um, cause shoulder pain is a sudden increase in volume or intensity in your training program. So if you follow the advice on the program that I've given you there, we slowly ramp it up both in terms of the number of sessions you're doing, the volume of sessions you're doing, and as you get fitter we'll be able to start to increase the intensity. Don't start this program like a bull in a china shop. There's only one way that's, that things are going to go from there, and it's definitely south. Okay, so I'm just going to bring up the uh, the slides back up again. She's gone. She's got a much much prettier face than I have. There we go. Okay, so video analysis, like I mentioned before, we can get you in for uh, for some of that to check whether or not you might have some of these issues within the stroke um, and uh, try to actually rectify them early days before you get into too, uh, too heavy of a training program. Obviously, physio um, will be good for managing any excessive pain, as will massage on a regular basis as well, but certainly um, you're your um, your cost your budget is going to go through the roof if we're getting if you're getting constantly um, constantly injured exact etc as you're going along best thing to be is to be proactive of course and make sure that technically you're swimming as best you possibly can and not doing anything with your shoulders which could actually just take a quick fix with respect to how your hands entering into the water and that itself might help to alleviate symptoms of pain within the shoulder like I mentioned check out swimsmooth.com forward slash injury for further information. So a couple of solutions on race day. Um, I like to use this example as something which has helped me. Basically if my, one of my shoulders is going to get sore during a marathon swim it's usually my left hand side. I've had a couple of ultrasounds this year and it does look like that one is the one which um, which is um, has a little bit more uh, degeneration than the right hand side. I blame a lot of this on the fact that um, as a triathlete I only ever used to breathe to my right hand side. So my rotation, if you even now if you look at my stroke, my rotation to my right is still better than my rotation to my left hand side, even though of course now I do breathe bilaterally consistently. So that lack of rotation over the years has obviously put a little bit of pressure and, uh, pressure and stress on that left hand side and um, that really came to a head when I tried to swim across the English Channel in 2011. Basically, we had a very, very rough day. If you haven't seen the YouTube video clip, it's, uh, it's something else. 25 to 35 knot headwind the whole way across to uh, across to France, taking me about 12 hours to get across there. I was hoping to do it in around about nine or even under nine hours. So um, it was quite a disappointing day from the weather perspective. But uh, what was interesting was the, the boat that took us across there came and sat on my right-hand side. 
and you would think for somebody who normally likes to breathe to his right hand side that would be a great thing because every time I breathe to the right I'd be able to see where the boat was. Unfortunately what was start, starting to happen was because I was having to do this quite regularly and uh, break away from my bilateral breathing routine I had to, uh, my left shoulder started to get sore so I had to ask the crew after three hours could I possibly come and sit on the other side of the boat they all looked at me like I was crazy saying you can't do that it's too rough it's too choppy you're going to get smashed around but I knew that unless I went on the other side of the boat and started breathing more frequently to my left hand side it was going to be game over with respect to my shoulder so that's what I did for the next hour, nine hours I went and breathed to my least favorite side so if you can breathe bilaterally and have that flexibility to breathe to either side that's going to help improve the health of your shoulders it will help in the conditions that you're swimming in as well but um, what I knew was in that case was if I would breathe a little bit more to my left my rotation to my left is going to be improved on a regular frequent basis and that's going to take a bit of strain off that left shoulder other things you can be looking out for is obviously avoiding any sort of thumb first so maybe your pad leg can just sort of check and if you complain that your shoulders starting to get to getting sore maybe your pad leg can let you know whether or not it looks as though you're waving at them from the side that would be a bad thing also try spearing into the water a little bit deeper than normal if you spear into the water reach forward and end up starting your catch by pushing down against the full weight of the water that's going to put your shoulders in a very compromised position and will put a lot of pressure and strain on them if you think about spearing slightly deeper than normal then what that'll, what that'll do is it'll serve to reduce that period of time where you're actually pushing down on the water and obviously increase the, uh, the ability to get into the catch a little bit sooner now this is generally good technique advice anyway but if you do start to experience symptoms of pain while swimming across the rot nest, then that's one of the things that will help with that. Um, one other thing, of course, if things get really bad, is um, aside from the fact that maybe you take on board some neurofen or other anti-inflammatory um, orally during the swim, you could, and I have done this myself in the, in the past, I've got a very bad left shoulder on my first rot nest solo swim, I end up swimming and opening up my fingertips quite far apart on the left hand. Um, during that particular swim just to allow the water to slip through my fingers whilst this was not good for my propulsion of course it did take a bit of pressure off that left shoulder and at the end of the day if this is you doing your solo swim for the first time you're trying to get across to Rottnest Island um, or you, you, you're simply your goal is to get across to Rottnest Island um, you're not worried so much about how long it's going to take you but equally you don't want to end up with, uh, with two uh, two buggered shoulders <laughs> sorry excuse the uh, excuse the swear there um, for the uh, for the future for, for the future and long term so looking after your shoulders very very important indeed in marathon swimming some stretches that I like to do the uh, I've just talked from the uh, in clockwise fashion from the top left this here is Michelle uh, my wife physio wife um, with a, a towel just rolled up under her back she's just doing a thoracic spine stretch so um, basically with that towel just rolled up underneath the uh, upper back stretching out fingertips interlaced and then stretching back and that's just helping to open up her spine um, the stretch in the middle there the whole what is labeled up as a whole body stretch is a bit of a twist so it's like a body twist starting off with both hands on the side and then just actually rotating out to open them up almost in a crucifix position whilst keeping your knees off to the side there that again just helps to stretch out through the pectoral muscles and, uh, and also just puts a, a control twist down the, down the length of the spine there the uh, top right picture, the lattice, latissimus dorsi, the lat muscles. Of course, these can become quite uh, quite stiff during uh, during training. Um, this little exercise is very good for just helping to stretch those out, and is more controlled than you might see people doing it up against a wall, where they tend to actually arch their lower back and put a lot of pressure and strain on the lower back there. Another good one, bottom left here. Michelle says she doesn't like this uh, photo. Looks like she's got a massive belly. She has just given birth to our. Uh, to our second daughter, or to our, to our daughter um, Isla, so please excuse the belly there. Um, this is a tricep stretch, just leaning up against the wall or up against a friend. I call this one the floozy position for obvious reasons. The hand on the hip is optional, but just stretching through the triceps there is a good way of doing it. And then down in the bottom right, arguably my favorite stretch for, for freestyle swimming, uh, up against a wall or with a partner, bending your elbow to 90 degrees. And, uh, and just turning away from that fixed elbow position. 
what you want to be doing in this position is not popping the shoulder forward, which many people make the mistake of doing, especially if they do the stretch with a straightened arm. Bend the elbow at 90 degrees, think about drawing your shoulder blades together and back, and feel the stretch coming through the front of the chest there. On to nutrition. Now, world's best nutrition, 32 GI, question mark, you decide, of course. Well, 32 GI is a, is a company um, based over in South Africa, and uh, whilst I have no formal official affiliation with 32 GI, it is the arguably the best nutrition which I have personally ever used in any of my training, and I use it in all my training and all my racing right now, and it's, uh, it's been an absolute uh, wonderful experience for me getting to use this product. I've tried pretty much everything else on the market, and many other products um, for me personally tend to give me quite a little bit of uh, gastrointestinal discomfort, um, or I just feel like they, uh, the the sugar complex is um, is 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 too simple and uh, can release um, release the energy into my system a little bit too quickly. The whole idea behind 32 GI is 32 GI stands for glycemic index and 32, the number 32 being a low number on that index, indicating that this formula is designed to um, spread things out, uh, your endurance, manage your endurance um, delivery, or energy delivery, I should say, over a longer period of time. So uh, give that a little bit of a check out. It's in most stores around Perth now, especially like the Sports Fever stores, and um, I believe Wembley Cycles also carries that line as well. So, um, in terms of um, more sort of uh, general um, advice on, on nutrition, obviously the different types of drinks you can be looking at are carbohydrate drinks, electrolyte drinks, and then what has become a little bit of a fashion drink is also the carbohydrate protein drink mix. If we just go back to uh, carbohydrate drinks, of course, what you're looking for here is a, um, is a certain amount of carbohydrate in grams per, per 100 mils. Um, or, or as a as a um, as a um, as a combined amount, what you tend to find is in something like a bottle, 500 ml bottle of something like Gatorade, you'll get around about 40 grams of carbohydrates during that period. The common uh, formula used to work out how much energy somebody needs is one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight per hour. So somebody like myself weighing in around about 75 kilograms, I should be supposedly consuming around about 70 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Now, personally, I found that to be too much. I now actually operate on around about 50 to 50 gram, 50, sorry, 50 to 55 grams of carbohydrate per hour. This is a very individual thing, and you need to experiment to see what works best for you. Maybe starting off at that at that simple formula uh, using your body weight. So again, one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight per hour as a bit of a benchmark and, and see how you go with that. Obviously, when your head's down in the water, for those of you doing triathlon, etc., taking in nutrition on the bike and the run is relatively simple compared to doing it in the swim. Um, typically, on the swim, you want to be pausing every 20 to 30 minutes to take on board some nutrition. Anything more than that, if you get down to like 10 or 15 minute stops, then you're going to be losing a lot of time out there. So you can probably imagine the, the issue that presents itself with is that it's harder to take on board a larger amount of carbohydrate. And what you tend to do is if you take it all on board too quickly within that 10 to 15 second um, um, fuel stop, you might end up getting gastrointestinal problems. So just watch out for that and um, see, what, um, see what numbers work best for you. Obviously, practice being essential. Electrolyte drinks. Um, obviously, there are some... Um, um, energy drinks such as uh, Gatorade, for example, which contain both carbohydrate and electrolyte. Electrolyte being able to replenish the salts that you lose through sweating. You do, uh, believe it or not, actually lose sweat whilst you're swimming, even in colder water. Um, so it's quite important to actually replenish your stocks of that. How much you need to be taken on board, again, is a very individual thing. Um, a lot of people experience cramping during longer swims, and uh, magnesium can be a very good source of uh, helping to, to prevent that. Um, as can just simply, if you feel a cramp coming on, just try to actually loosen off that. It's very common to feel this in the underside of the foot and also in the calf muscle as well. 
So if you feel a cramp coming on, make sure you just start to shake out that little area uh, before it actually really bites in. Because once you've got a cramp, as you'll know, it's quite hard to actually get rid of it. So carbon protein drinks, usually the mix here is four parts carbohydrates, one part protein. The idea being that even um, during, a, uh, during a training session, of course, your muscles are breaking down. They need protein to be replaced um, to help to regenerate the muscles. Um, certain companies have come up with a carb protein mix to ensure that even during your training session, you're actively recovering towards the end of the training session to ensure that you're not breaking the muscles down too much. Personally, I don't get on very well with these drinks at all. I find they make me quite bloated and also give me a little bit of a headache as well. So again, use them with caution, test them out in training long before you do the event. Gels, um, personally, I tend to use um, my particular format is I will have 250 mils of um, 32 GI, the endurance formula. I will have that on every two kilometers, basically. So at two kilometers, I'll have 250 mils. And then at the 4K mark, the 8K mark, the 12, the 16K mark, I'll actually also take on board a gel with that formula as well. So a carbohydrate gel, something like goo energy gels, I really quite like them. I find them very palatable, the right sort of texture. But there are obviously other manufacturers out there, such as Carbo Shots, who, um, who do do uh, carbohydrate gels as well. So again, experiment with them. Chews. Um, these are great for cycling and running, but I've always found, even though 32GI do a very, very good chew, I've always found that the uh, chews are actually quite hard to swallow during a marathon swimming event. So um, just watch out for, uh, for whether or not you can actually do that, because the last thing you want to be doing is swallowing seawater at the same time as trying to chomp on some uh, on, a, on a bit of a chew there, and, uh, and ultimately making yourself a little bit, a little bit sick. On that note, of course, nausea is a um, is an interesting thing and does cause people quite a bit of um, bit of problems swimming across to rot nest. That could simply be from motion sickness. Um, personally, I take one of the Travel Calm uh, ginger pills, which is the natural remedy. You can just get over the counter from the pharmacy, which will help to um, help to alleviate any any symptoms of um, of uh, motion sickness out there. Um, I'm not sure if I do get motion sickness. I've always had one of these little pills, so whether or not it's that or whether or not I don't get it, but uh, personally, I'm, I've been quite lucky in that respect. I've never actually been sick during a marathon swimming event. Um, I think one of the biggest contributing factors to that sickness is simply people getting their nutrition plan wrong, potentially from overeating or over in ingesting things, or like I mentioned before, sucking in water whilst they're trying to chew some of the things down. So um, again, just watch out for that and uh, certainly try the tip with the, uh, with the little hand. Um, anti seasickness tablets. Um, energy bars, um, again these are quite hard to consume whilst you're in the water but just as something, some of you will actually like to have something on your palate which just tastes a little bit different than a gel or a carbohydrate drink. Um, I did try to, try to eat a Cadbury Boost during, uh, during my English Channel Swim and that was very very hopeless but I did really fancy it at the time and just that little bit of taste of chocolate in my mouth was a wonderful thing to push me to, across, the, across the finish line so do experiment, experiment with energy bars by all means. But this is the key, try nothing new on race day. So trying nothing new on race day, that's the absolute key tip. Okay, and that, reply, that applies to nutrition, it applies to pacing, it applies to new goggles, caps, etc, etc, etc. Make sure you've tested everything to the nth degree before you race across to Rottnest Island. Okay, don't change anything the day before. Don't be lured into false sense of security. Somebody else has bought a brand new pair of goggles and they suggest you get them and you get them and you don't have time to test them out before the event. That could mean disaster. Please don't do that on race day. That's just a feeding strategy. This um, this was at the um, Manhattan Island Marathon swim back in June. This is towards the start of the race. In fact, I think my first feeding stop. You can see here that Amanda's passed me my 250 ml bottle of uh, 32 GI, which I'm just downing without the top on. Um, it was taking me approximately 10 seconds to get this down. I'd actually do a, a backstroke arm recovery with the other arm. This is not an opportunity for you to sit and chat to your paddler. Okay, now I don't mean that in the, in in such a strong term in terms of you can't have fun swimming across to Rottnest Island, but a lot of people are actually concerned about getting cold swimming across to Rottnest Island. Um, the temperature typically is between about 22 and 24 degrees, but if you are quite a, a, a lean swimmer, 
obviously the longer you stay stationary in the water, chatting to your paddler, chatting to your boat crew, etc., the quicker you're going to get cold. So try to make your drink stops as quick as possible. Okay, people often think that I'm quite grumpy when I'm racing, but all I'm trying to do is just get it, get on with it, get the drink down, and get on to the next section. Okay, use it by all means as a bit of respite between the monotony of the long swim, etc. Okay, but don't spend too long in that position. Okay, nearly done. Skippers and navigation here then. So good sighting is important in build up to the uh, the open water races. But on the race day, make sure you leave it to your paddler and skipper to take care of that. You can see Kyman here, ladies winner at the Manhattan Island swim and my training partner, sighting very effectively forward, lifting only her eyes out of the water, not her mouth as well. Um, what you want to be careful of though of course in during the marathon swim is doing that too frequently. A because it sinks the legs and B because it puts a lot of stress on the back of the neck and the upper back and shoulders as well. So leave your navigation to your skipper and to your paddler. You get on with your swimming. Trust in them. Trust in them that they're going to take you in a nice straight line across to Rot Nest. And obviously what we're going to talk about now is the planning behind that. So registrations open Monday the 4th of November for just one week. So it's very important that you're starting to think about if you haven't already done so, who is going to be in your crew? Who's going to be paddling? Who's going to be on the boat? Who's your skipper? Have you got a reliable boat? Get that sorted now as a course of urgency before you uh, before the registrations start to open up. So get together with a good crew and plan, plan, and plan. Sometimes at the eleventh hour, it's very common to hear this. People drop out from your crew. The skipper loses his boat. You have to swap around and search for whoever you can get on the race day. It's still so, so important, even at the very latest hour, to ensure that you get your team together and make sure you know exactly what the plan is for the day. Classic example of this happened to me this year in that we hadn't, if, uh, if truth be known, we hadn't uh, gone through our, um, our plan as well as we possibly could do, and I blame myself uh, for that. Um, at the start of the swim, we set off, and as you'll probably know, you swim 500 metres straight out into the ocean, get collected by a paddler and then about uh, another thousand meters later you get collected by your motorboat, motorboat crew. What happened for me unfortunately was I met my paddler but my paddler and myself couldn't find the boat and we were treading water for around about 10 minutes there obviously losing ground on the swimmers I was apparently in second or third place at that point in time I lost a massive amount of ground and never made that up during the rest of the event very very frustrating for me what we have learned from doing the Manhattan Island swim is that obviously every boat in Rottnest carries a marine radio but what I've actually now uh, invested in is a little, mar little marine radio um, to go between the paddler and the boat themselves as well many paddlers will take a mobile phone but getting reception out there can be questionable with a small marine radio hopefully you can have direct feedback or contact between the boat and, um, and the paddler to ensure that you all meet up together and you don't waste any time out there being held up by the police at the Lewin boat which is what happened to me this year so um, yeah maybe get together your plan for that obviously you know having your paddler wearing attractive clothing bright clothing for the boat to see and equally for you to stand out within the solo group maybe you've painted your arms pink or green or something like that can certainly help as well I did all those things and we still got it wrong this year so it's very frustrating if that happens for you especially if you're trying to uh, contend a place at the Rock Mist Channel Swim. Ultimately leave the navigation down to your crew get your head down and swim that's one of the key things I learned from the Manhattan Swim at the start I was doing what Kyman was doing here in the picture sighting forwards etc but unfortunately I just thought halfway around about two hours in I just thought I've just got to get my head down let's just trust Amanda let's just trust Adam on the boat let's trust the trust my whole crew get my head down concentrate on the swimming and we'll get across there and obviously we did that quite well and there we are celebrating afterwards okay number one Amanda in the middle my paddler Evan from heaven over here on the right hand side my GPS navigation expert who goes around the island and of course my best friend there Adam hidden in the back with a sort of gurning going on he was my uh, motivator getting me around the course and obviously my, uh, my best, man, best mate supporting me for the event. Okay finally then additional resources now you don't need to, you don't certainly don't need all the suggested gear to make the different make a difference but it will certainly help 
So let's have a look at uh, some of the optional uh, bits and pieces you could incorporate. So general training kit, obviously within our squads, if you're swimming within our squad, uh, flippers, paddles, pool boy are fairly essential items. The paddles here off on the left hand side are excellent. Uh, they're made by Finis over in California. They're designed like an arrowhead with just a single strap for your middle finger. We mentioned early on about the possibility of shoulder pain being created or caused by a thumb first entry and a crossover in front of the head. These paddles help to identify that because if you're doing either of those two things, they fall off your hand as you're entering into the water. So getting yourself a pair of these Finis Freestylers will be excellent and trying to incorporate them into your training program as a technique aiding tool. The Finis Tempo Trainer, I mentioned earlier on about critical swim speed and identifying what that is. Using a Finis Tempo Trainer, you can very accurately and precisely input your uh, threshold pace. So let's say, for example, your threshold pace is 140 per 100. That breaks down to 25 seconds per 25 meters. You can simply plug in the beeper to beep at you every 25 seconds and just ensure that you're at each 25 meter marker every time it beeps. Very simple way to pace out your efforts. CSS plus six might become 146 per 100, in which case you'd actually want to input 26.50 seconds into the beeper. Using this little device, you can really help to uh, develop your pace awareness and, uh, and get you well set for, uh, for the Rottnest Channel Swim. Highly recommended at only 50 or 60 bucks, um, available through swimsmooth.com small plug there. Um, this is a great training tool and something if you're doing a lot of training by yourself, highly, highly recommend it. Garmin GPS, if you're going to be swimming in the open water, uh, which of course I hope you are, training up for the Rottnest Channel Swim, being in the open water itself, um, a Garmin GPS can be a very useful tool. I personally use the Garmin 310 XT, which retails in Australia for around about $350. I don't use, the, use it as a watch, I take the straps off and stick it under my swimming cap, so I've got a good GPS readout. I set the Garmin to beep at me every 500 meters just to help me break down the monotony of a longer swim. So rather than thinking about a 10,000 meter swim or 10K swim being you know, endlessly monotonous, all I'm thinking of is a series of 20 times 500 meters. Now that might sound even more daunting to some of you, but when you're out there, just getting that little bit of a vibration, bit of a buzz to know that you're at the next 500 meter marker just keeps you focused on that next 500 rather than getting too concerned about um, how much more you have left to swim. So I highly recommend the Garmin GPS and obviously they can uh, show you how well you're tracking when you download this to Google Maps and uh, see how straight of a line you've been holding for your training swims. The Swim Smooth book and waterproof training plans, you expected some plugs from me here surely. Um, these are an excellent way to, um, to incorporate some of the training programs and uh, session ideas that we've been talking about in tonight's presentation. The Swim Smooth book in particular, which was released in June 2012, uh, contains a whole sequence of um, training sessions in the back of that book, showing you how to actually incorporate them on a weekly basis, etc. Well worth the £15, or uh, I think it's £17 now, uh, book placement for one of those books, or $30 here in, the US, uh, in, in Australia. So get yourself a copy and get swimming smooth. Obviously, we've got a lot of information up at swimsmooth.com to, uh, to uh, consolidate what we talked about today. So check out some of the free articles there as well. Now, this um, just sort of leave you with this, basically. Um, when you're training up for an event like this, what I found really quite sort of motivating for me was I set up a uh, Twitter account just before the Manhattan Island Marathon Swim. I figured that in 10 weeks, I should be able to do 50 sessions. And my little plan was to actually post out those 50 sessions as I did them, also the sort of speeds I was holding and how I felt during them. You only have 140 characters of course to deal with uh, to actually put out there, but just the notion that there might even just be one person out there listening to what I was actually doing um, was a great way to sort of encourage me to, um, you know, to make sure my training was going along consistently. I didn't want to miss a session in case somebody out there in Twitterland uh, maybe, thought, uh, maybe thought I was being slack or something like that. So posting out those sessions was quite a good way of, uh, of doing it and uh, it might just help you as well. So that's a collection of kit, of course. There's those Finis Freestyler paddles, or Finis. 
those are tempo trainers. This is from a pulsation. What these tempo trainers are also very good at doing, they're all set here to stroke rate mode. So if you look at the one in the middle, 62 strokes per minute, the one down the bottom left, 63 strokes per minute, etc., etc., etc. You can use these to monitor your rhythm and tempo during longer swims as well. Because obviously when you're in the uh, swimming pool, some of you might have been used to counting how many strokes you do per length or knowing exactly what pace you're holding per 100 meters out there in the open water much much more difficult to use that as a measure of um, as a reference point so how well you're going in fact of course measuring strokes per length is not possible at all using the uh, tempo trainer in your training program you can dial in a rhythm um, which you might be able to maintain so for example I maintained 81 strokes per minute around the seven and a half quarter hour swim course around the Manhattan Island Marathon swim uh, my guys on my boat were just monitoring for whether or not that uh, that number fluctuated too much up or down too much up and I'm probably just slipping and fighting the water a little bit in a hurry like I was at the start of the swim and uh, too much down on that point so more than about five or ten percent lower than that point and my crew is starting to get concerned that I might be getting either excessively fatigued or hypothermia might be setting in that was a particularly cold swim 14 to 15 degrees in a non wet suit and uh, made for a challenging swim so these tempo trainers are great like I say 50 to 60 bucks for one of these little chappies set you up and uh, and bosh away you go they will keep you on track I think of mine as my little virtual training partner because unfortunately being a billionaire mate so that tends to swim that frequently frequently with too many people so if you can join me down at Claremont Swimming Pool please do so I'm always glad of the uh, company but uh, otherwise I'll be relying upon my Denise Tempo Trainer Pro and this is what I've been doing um, leading up to, uh, to the Manhattan Island swim. So my 10 400 red miss set I was doing over in Canada didn't have access to a, a decent enough swimming pool, one that was uh, in a reasonable temperature anyway. So I set my beeper here to beep at me every four, uh, 400 meters or 0.4 of a kilometer and set the beeper there to give me five minutes and 12 seconds, 18 per 100. What I then did simply was 10 times 400 meters, making sure that I reach 400 meters when the tempo trainer beeps as well. So it's quite an um, exercise. You don't know you're going to be on it until you get right to that 5 minute 12 marker. So it's quite a good exercise. Very, very motivating in a, yeah, in a cold water lake by myself. Don't underestimate the power of teamwork leading into this event. One of the things we're blessed with over here in Perth in Western Australia is obviously some fantastic open water and pool venues. Uh, this here is Wayne the Train on the left hand side looking absolutely ginormous. Kaiman in the middle looking absolutely tiny. Me looking moderately big in the, uh, on, towards the uh, right hand side of the frame. And then very good friend Paul Downey over here on the right hand side training up for our attempt at the English Channel in 2011. So even if you're going to be swimming with somebody within the squad or with a teammate, etc., who's a lot slower than yourself, don't be put off by that. Just the fact that you might be meeting up together to start a session together can be very, very motivating indeed. And uh, highly encourage you to do that if and where possible. Final point then, JKS. You've probably heard this one before. Just keep swimming. This was um, from one of my good friends, James Anderson. He wrote that on his uh, forearm when he did his first Rottnest solo swim in 2009. Uh, when we got across to Thompson's Bay, I saw him drinking this bottle of beer and said, you know, what the heck is that written on your arm? And he said, well, I just kept looking down. And when I was, when I was going through the hard times, I just thought, just keep swimming. And many of you will know that phrase has been a quote from um, Finding Nemo. Um, just keep swimming, just keep swimming is, is, what, um, is what Dory was saying there underneath the water. Anyway, let's just come out of here then. I'll just sign off. Now, I'm not sure if anyone's actually been tuning into this uh, live, but um, I'll basically put out the uh, put out the, the uh, on this and um, send out the link. All right. We come back to the uh, screen there now. Yep, there we go. So I do hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you found it quite useful. By all means, if you do have any unanswered questions, shoot them over to me. But I think it should all be fairly, uh, fairly self-explanatory. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this. And by all means, share it around your friends. Excellent stuff. Very best of luck for the next 21 weeks or 144 days.